It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first public lecture of the British Pharmacological Society and it's a particular pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Leslie Iverson, to give his talk on bringing cannabis back into the medicine cabinet. It's a pleasure to be invited to give the first uh, public lecture to BPS. I'd like to make it clear I'm speaking here as a private citizen, uh, a retired professor of pharmacology, not in my capacity as the chairman of the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs, and I will refuse to answer any questions about recreational uses of cannabis or its classification, which the Advisory Council have considered on three different occasions in the last 10 years, and I hope I never hear about it again. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to talk about instead is our, our, the medical uses of cannabis and, and the revival of interest that we see around the world in, in, in this aspect of the, of the plant. Um, and I'll tell you what's happening in this country and, and, and some of the snapshots from around the world. And my lecture, being a public lecture, pharmacologists may be disappointed because there won't be very much science uh, in the lecture. Uh, very few chemical structures and uh, uh, more emphasizing the social history and, and, uh, and the medical history of the, of the subject. Subject is, uh, is the uh, product of the, of the cannabis plant, uh, a herbal uh, material uh, in America known as marijuana, and uh, uh, the, the actual drug is secreted by bracts around the flowering heads of the plant, particularly concentrated in the female flowering heads, uh, the male flowering heads are a nuisance because they get in the way and don't produce much drug. And this male uh, plants also allow the female plants to make uh, seeds and they get in the way of uh, cannabis smokers. Most cannabis is now grown as a, as, a, as a female plant form. And I'll show you later a growing facility in the south of England, the only legal one we have in this country, where uh, all the plants are female and they're all uh, cloned from one single female plant. For gardeners in the audience, this means they're all re reproduced by cuttings. It's a, a cloning sounds a much better word, but uh, that's what it is. And the active ingredient, psychoactive ingredient in, in the cannabis uh, resin is, is this lovely creature, Delta 9 THC, uh, first described uh, in the early 1970s by Mac Mac Raphael Makhum in Israel. The pure THC is a thick greasy, uh, viscous treacle, uh, very hard to handle and very difficult to administer because it's totally insoluble in water. And there are no uh, polar groups, so you can't make salts of this chemical. Um, and we'll come to how you can administer it uh, in a moment. But that's the active ingredient. There are about 50 other so-called uh, herbal cannabinoids, which have, this, have similar ring structures but nearly all of them are inactive in terms of their intoxicant properties and inactive on the receptor, which I'll tell you about in a moment. The history of medical cannabis goes back a very long way, thousands of years in, in China and particularly in India. And this gentleman, William O'Shaughnessy, was a Victorian uh, brilliant uh, genius who brought cannabis back from India. He, he was a remarkable man. He was trained as a doctor but already at the age of 22, during his training, had the idea for treating uh, cholera with fluid electrolyte balanced uh, replacement, which is still the treatment for cholera today and, and all those uh, um, diseases characterized by severe diarrhea, dysentery, etc. And this, this is a brilliant uh, step forward in, in medical treatments, very cheap and still very widely used. But he went on, joined the East India Company as it was in those days. So he was a physician, surgeon, professor of chemistry, and also a research scientist. And the research scientist bit was very important for the cannabis story because he got interested in the, the folk use of cannabis in India and started systematically studying it uh, in, in uh, sort of uh, medical trials using some animal research, basic research, and convinced himself that there was something uh, in the story that cannabis actually did have some medical benefits. In 1841, when he returned to India, he brought some cannabis with him and, and generally popularized the whole idea of cannabis as a medicine, which took off very rapidly in the 19th century when very few other medicines were around. And I'll show you some of the preparations that, that uh, uh, were made and, and widely marketed. 
But uh, Shaun as he wasn't finished, he went back to India and, and uh, among other achievements, installed 3,500 miles of, uh, of, uh, of uh, telegraph network throughout the entire continent, um, which was uh, extremely useful to the British uh, in, in, in putting down some of the native uh, uh, mutinies at the time. And, and just another remarkable achievement from a remarkable man. Cannabis became widely available, and, and the, the standard British pharmacopoeia product is, is and, and in America was uh, this thing called tincture of cannabis. It's simply an alcoholic extract of the, uh, of the female flowering heads or the resin. And you can see it's made by the company that Ray and I used to work for, uh, or rather Sharp and Dome part of it. We used to work for Merck Sharp and Dome. But um, this was the original Sharp Dome company in America, and tincture of cannabis was widely available over the counter and, and claimed to treat lots of different diseases and present in lots of proprietary medicines. For example, you could go to a Victorian pharmacy and buy all sorts of things over the counter that you, you couldn't dream of buying today. You could buy morphine, opium in various different preparations. You could buy cannabis in, in all sorts of different preparations. And one that was particularly popular was uh, Dr. Collis Brown's Chlorodyne. This was an absolute bestseller in Victorian England and went on for some time into the 20th century. And, it, and it's no wonder that it had such wide indications. Coughs, colds, uh, you can read some of it here. Um, cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, uh, all legitimate uh, uses for this compound because it, it contained about 50% uh, tincture of cannabis and 50% laudanum, which is an alcoholic extract of uh, opium. And, and in t in together with that, a certain amount of chloroform. So <laughs> the claims made for it were actually probably quite accurate, that it was a cure-all for all, all, almost all diseases it, at a time when you have to remember that mon modern medicines just weren't available. How many people became addicted to chlorodyne or how many suffered, uh, we'll never know, because addiction wasn't even thought about in those days until late in the, in the 19th century. But um, eventually it dawned on some smart doctors in the BMJ article here, 1974, it took a long time to dawn on that people that the, the morphine contained in the uh, collis chlorodyne mixture was, was probably quite dangerously addictive. By that time the, the cannabis had been uh, more or less removed, but there was still a, a, a good dose of morphine to be had. And these doctors uh, cleverly observed what they, what they thought were eight cases of chlorodyne dependence in London drug clinic, and they described the, the symptoms as being just like those seen in classical opiate uh, dependence and, 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 and estimated that as many as 1,000 young men in London might be addicted at the time. But it hadn't occurred to anyone that selling uh, a medicine, this was still not a prescription medicine even, selling an over-the-counter medicine that was sufficiently potent to, to lead to um, opiate dependence and tolerance was, was not a very good idea. However, you can go to your chemist tomorrow and you can still buy Collis Brown's mixture. It's a poor shadow of its former self, but it does contain a small amount of morphine and it does treat diarrhea quite effectively. And in addition to the small amount of morphine, which is hardly worth having for a heroin addict, uh, there is a large dose of peppermint oil which is also quite good for the digestive system and would make it quite painful, I suspect, to uh, try to inject this stuff intravenously. So, but there, you know, there you are. a good product never dies. It always finds a new life somehow. But let's get back to the science of this. What, what is it about THC that makes it so interesting and potentially useful medically? Well, see, THC, like a number of other plant products, including morphine, uh, is... Although they are plant chemicals, they're recognized in the mammalian brain, in the human brain, by a specific set of receptors, that is, proteins on the surface of nerve cells and other cells in the body. Um, and there are, for, for THC cannabis, there are two sorts. There's the CB1, which is principally the type you find in the brain, and thought to be largely responsible, if not entirely responsible, for the intoxicant effects. And then there's another one called the CB2 receptor, which is found mainly in peripheral tissues in the immune system, on, on different cells in the immune system, and may have THC-like chemicals, which I'll come to later, uh, may have a role uh, as, as immune system messengers, in addition to the, 
role of, of the system in the brain. Now we happen to have, uh, for research purposes, a very useful compound developed by the French company Sanofi, a compound called Ramonabant. I'll have more to say about that later. But Ramonabant turns out to be a very selective CB1 receptor antagonist. And to a pharmacologist, they'd love to have antagonists. They can try and find out by using the antagonist what, what functions the receptor may have normally. And we can say the Ramonabant blocks essentially all the psychoactive actions of, uh, of cannabis. In, in, in experienced cannabis smokers, given Ramonabant, uh, they hardly feel a thing when they smoke the cannabis cigarette. And also the pain relieving effects of uh, THC are blocked, largely blocked by Ramonabant. And they can, you can also manipulate the system in other ways nowadays by, by generating strains of mice that have no ability to express the CB1 receptor, so they grow up without any CB1 receptors, and those mice uh, no longer respond to the pain-relieving effects of uh, THC, and presumably they can't get high at all. THC itself uh, has been around as a, as a prescription medicine, surprisingly, for quite a long time. It's got two indications in the USA. One is uh, treating the wasting syndrome in AIDS patients who tend to lose appetite and, and literally waste away. And among other things, THC is an appetite stimulant. It's also used as an antiemetic. Uh, it's got powerful uh, anti-nausea, anti-vomiting properties. The synthetic compound you see at the bottom here, uh, nabilone, is one of the many synthetic uh, chemicals made by pharmaceutical companies. After THC structure was discovered, the pharmaceutical industry tried to make a medical version of THC which lacked the intoxicant properties. And there are hundreds of uh, publications in the Journal of MedChem and other chemistry journals about uh, describing a number of very potent uh, cannabis-like, not cannabis-like chemically, but cannabis-like pharmacologically, acting on the same CB1 receptor. And this is just one of them. It happens to have some medical use and, and is approved also as an antiemetic, although very, very little used. Neither of these compounds have been very, little, very much used, although they're available as prescription medicines, have been for 20 years or more. And the reason they're not used is taking uh, THC by mouth, orally as these preparations are, um, the preparations are THC dissolved in uh, sesame oil or some other uh, vehicle in a gelatin capsule and you swallow it. And then the absorption after a, a oral administration is very uh, unpredictable. Depends on whether you've just had a meal, whether it was a fatty meal. Uh, um, um, so you can get different absorptions in the same person from one, one event to another. And uh, it's generally very unreliable. It's very slow. It takes several hours to reach peak plasma concentration. And generally, patients find it's better to smoke herbal cannabis because it's much quicker. However, they've been there, and they are there. And the revival of interest in this area uh, it is described in a very good uh, document that, uh, produced by the Welcome, Welcome History of Medicine just last year. Um, if you're interested in the, the recent history of how cannabis as a medicine suddenly came back into favor, partic particularly in this country, you should try and uh, take a read of this. It's very, very good. And it has been quite a remarkable story because we are now, partly because the government to everyone's surprise, perhaps, was particularly lenient, and maybe because of the House of Lords inquiry in 1998 that uh, Walter Perry uh, chaired, and I was the scientific advisor at the time, and, and produced a report saying there, there were probably medical benefits to be had in cannabis. And this gentleman here, Jeffrey Guy, shown with his cannabis plants in the legal greenhouse somewhere in the south of England, uh, that's him with his female cloned uh, cannabis plants. And the powers that be in the Home Office and the, and the various other government departments involved were very receptive to the idea and gave him permission not only to set up a growing facility but also gave him permission to do clinical trials, which is quite a big step forward because this is, remember, a Schedule 1 compound. Schedule 1 means this compound is dangerously psychoactive and has no medical indications. So for a Schedule 1 drug to be permitted to go into clinical trial, that was a big step forward.